There we go. In yep, theory, we are live that. on the internet. Um, or at least it should be momentarily. <clears throat> so, um, there we go. Uh, so, how has uh, everybody's week been so far? I know it's only Tuesday, but for me, it feels like I've done two weeks in two days. What is time? Yes. Yeah, pretty much that. I've, I've just had a, a week off work, uh, which has uh, been great because I managed to go in my front and my back garden. Um, so uh, actually, I really enjoyed it, actually, even though I was at home, um, just not doing work. Um, well, yeah, I'm first day back today um i was struggling a bit today but hopefully it'll get better as the week goes yeah man. and i feel like i spent the last two days in non-stop teams meetings pretty much <laughs> i think they're estimating the how much they need to take a break still People are sort of, I can't go anywhere. What's the point of using my holiday? But people really need time off and to relax right now. Good. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, we'll give everybody um, a few sort of a few minutes to to join and so on and, and catch up. Um, and then what we'll do is probably look to start probably quarter to seven, if that's all right with everybody. Uh, we're going to start with David first, um, and then we'll have like a little bit of a um, uh, break in the middle for uh, more chatting, grab beverages and so on. Um, and then we'll pick up the East Church. Hi everybody who's uh who's just joined. Um just heads up you'll be uh joining muted as you come in, so uh you will probably need to unmute yourselves. Oh, we need to sort out when we're going to do another recording of the past podcast as well, guys. I do. I've just uh, turned off the muting people on entry, so they'll come in muted if they choose to. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a busy, busy week. I mean, John and I are also, uh, Jonathan and I are also massively behind on good news. <laughs> so... <laughs> We've got to do that. When you put weekly in the title, it uh, sets a certain level of expectation. Yeah. We that, was, that was our expectation, to be fair. We just did the pilot. We haven't kicked off. That's that's the excuse. Yeah. Well, we've got a whole <laughs> bunch of people here. Does anybody have any good news that Jonathan and Liam can share? Smart yeah. idea. Yeah, it's very true. What did you talk about in your first one to give people an idea? Uh, a lot of animals and zoos, I think. There was quite a lot of animals. Uh, there was a a load of houseboat owners having a gig. There was yes. um, goats returning to a village because nobody was walking around it anymore. There was penguins roaming zoos. There was penguins having a having a free for all as zookeepers let them roam. Uh, what else was the other one? Oh, there was something about a reversing nature decline oh yeah it wasn't there like the um Bacchus, wasn't it no it was the so based on current reduced carbon emissions and, and less shipping 
if if they stayed at this level for like 30 years or something, mm. the seas would return to the the level they should be at or better or something along those lines. Should be good. So. Mm. Is there anything beyond that? <clears throat> yeah, it's uh, an interesting one because it'll, uh, with everything being as quiet as it is in terms of traffic and so on. I mean, there was. A, I don't think we included it in the news, but there was um, another article that I was reading about because there's there's less traffic. We're actually getting more accurate seismographic readings, mm. um, so we actually know what the Earth sounds like. I guess <laughs> would be the best way well, to. Describe. The fact that they were suggesting that they were now able to detect minor tremors from the other side of the world, whereas they'd never been able to do that before. Yeah, that's Bonkers. true. Because the exactly. Nepalese readings are down at eighty percent. Wow. Yeah, bonkers. Well, yeah, I think it's... Um, I don't it, want to jump ahead, but my, my good news would be around the, the 3D printed visors. We'll talk about that a bit later. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's, it's good to see that sort of thing, really. Yeah, it's, the, uh, it's where you see everyone pulling together. I've certainly had reports as well of, um, sort of more people being out in the country for walks, mm. not so much the number of people, but the people you know being respectful of the social distancing, but also they being much more friendly, or as it used to sort of you know, at best be a grunt. Now people are sort of, hi, how are you? And sort of more engaging than we were Very before. Much. So yeah, I don't think I bother with a uh, 3d printer myself on account of i will well you know me pretty well <laughs> and i would have already used it to print out all sorts of shit that i will never ever use but just because i could yeah i i've been getting more and more tempted to buy one but basically i would be using this as an excuse to buy one i do not in any way need one yeah i definitely don't need one but the the temptation to just print useless crap is definitely there like we've got one in the office um, in Uppingham and somebody's just used it to print like a, a, a Yoda, a, a baby Yoda paperweight. Well, that's it. Bought it exclusively for that. It's not been touched again since. But hopefully they use using <laughs> 3D visors. Well, we would if it wasn't in the office and we were allowed there. Um... <coughs> so, yeah. yeah the Sheffield company, Pi Minori, who do a lot of Raspberry Pi stuff have been using their kit to churn it out yeah what's on a stupid number you can do daily now if he needs to say that again sorry louise uh, mark at um nottingham he did say how many he could print a day um just going to see if i can get the number it's like he's got a lot of different 3d printers and he can just churn them out if he needs to right okay. uh, So how um, how's everybody else finding uh, lockdown? That well, I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I've been working from home now for about five years. So my wife pointed out that um, it's made no difference to me at all. <laughs> Which he did say is worrying. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm finding like, I, while I didn't, I, I only work from home on, on occasion. Uh, in terms of anything else, it's not really changed anything <laughs> for me. <laughs> like it'll be the odd thing, um, or oh, because I live reasonably out of the way, there's plenty enough to walk around without bumping into another person tend to bump into horses more than people. Yeah. Um, the work bit I'm absolutely fine with, you know, being mm. able to 
phone's great. I could do that forever. It's the it's the not at work bit. It's the after work and and that whole just low level worry about the world that that is more bothering me more than the lockdown. Uh, someone on Twitter described it as it's like you just opened up your task manager and you realise that there's this uh, weird process that doesn't seem to be doing anything called COVID-19 is using up 20% of your CPU cycles. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's just that constant not being able to quite focus on things. I think the, the actual lockdown bit isn't bothering me so much. The yep. reason for the lockdown, I think, is the thing that's getting to me. <laughs> what is, what's that doing? So what are people using to, to um, sort of do not work stuff while you're stuck in the house? Uh, still my laptop, <laughs> generally. Well, I found I've, I've moved from work laptop, which is over here, to home laptop here. <laughs> totally different. Right, as long as you can close one and then move to the other. Yeah, we'll pretend the other one isn't open right now. <laughs> oh, yes. I am uh, trying to put together a... Um model tank but I spilled half a bottle of uh, liquid glue all over my desk and um, that stopped proceedings for a good few hours. Yeah. But I bet it smelled was great. Uh, <laughs> mm, could say that. The cat didn't agree though. <laughs> you didn't stick the cat to the table did you? No, no, the cat made himself scarce. I think he's, he's getting fed up of the lockdown though. I think, I think all cats are, are fed up of us being around the house so much. I, I got bored and made this. Oh no, you can't. Mm, beauty of uh, backgrounds. Oh, awesome. It's too, um, it's too small for my fat head, though. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Spider Man's let himself go. <laughs> Please tell me you wear that to the supermarket because, you know, you're wearing masks and that sort of thing. It's good, right? Of course, I can't see out of it, but. Uh... Uh, yeah, and my spidey sense isn't as good as it ought to be. Okay. So uh, we'll give it another five minutes before we get uh, kick off proceedings. Um, so there are still people joining um, and uh, messaging saying that the the they've got a couple of problems joining from the me uh, meetup message. Uh, so we'll just get that sorted. Um, I do quite like the whole zoom straight out to YouTube, though. That seems to be working really well. That's good. Hmm. Definitely uh, really, really smooth. Yeah, it's only a couple of seconds behind as well. Mm. So who's, you, who's not using Zoom or Teams for anything? <laughs> well, I'm still using Google Meet at work. Yeah, we, I mean, we've, we kind of have a bit of everything. <laughs> so, what, why we have like, one? We've got Teams, there's Zoom. Uh, I'm sure there was something else that Kate cropped up the other day. Oh, there's something called Blue Jeans, which I've only ever seen one person use. Uh, but it's basically the same as Zoom. I actually ended up, in a, ended up in a WebEx meeting the other day. For the first time in years. <laughs> yeah, I've had the old WebEx. So. Have a quick look. <laughs> right. Wherever Pant has gone. Um, so I was uh, well this evening. Um, 
uh, Misha can't join us today because uh, she is celebrating her partner's birthday, I believe. Is that? Um, so I've enlisted my glam my glamorous assistants, Jonathan and Louise, uh, to help with uh, all the other stuff. Um, but yeah, so we should be able to get going uh, in a couple of minutes. So everyone's aware we'll uh, force mute for while the talks and presentations are on and then we will allow you to unmute after that for questions and discussions. Just seen there's a um, what you call it coming up as well um, on May the thirteenth and fourteenth. Uh, JetBrains is doing uh, .NET days. Uh, if uh, folks are interested in Jonathan, you might be less interested on account of it's sponsored by Twilio. Uh, nothing wrong with a bit of healthy competition. <laughs> they are everywhere though. Or Twilio. Mm. They write yeah, developer cool. focused stuff. I think we've um, them for a couple of things. I think we used them as an alert book before to make a phone call if a production system went down. That was kind of it. Cool. Right. So, um, I think we can probably get started, guys. Um, so let me share my screen. Uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, welcome to April's DevOps Nuts, everybody. Uh, this time we've slightly changed our hosting uh, side of things. Um, like I said earlier, uh, Misha isn't able to join us this evening. She's out, uh, well, say out, she's in, but out, <laughs> uh, celebrating a partner's uh, birthday. Uh, so I have uh, Louise Paling and Jonathan Ralph joining me uh, to assist this evening. Um, and first of all, uh, before we get into it, uh, Louise has a quick thing that she would like to say uh, with the side changes. There we go. Yeah, this is uh, a lot of people in the local tech community are 3D printing visors to help people on the, the first line of this who aren't able to get PPE. Uh, so the link down there, tech, not.tech slash COVID help is where you can go to find out more information. We're now in a fabulous position where the biggest thing we actually need is to find more people who need these. We've been able to supply uh, hundreds and hundreds of them they uh, were getting places we were supplying them to now able to get uh, the, the proper PPE. So we're now finding it's more care homes that need them. So if anybody knows anywhere that needs these, uh, please go to that link and you'll find out how to do it. Also, if you have a 3D printer and want to get involved, also follow the link and you can help be able to generate these for uh, anyone out there who needs them. Uh, some really uh, great stories coming back of uh, people grateful to be able to get something to help. I've personally got a friend who uh, works in a care home who, who contracted COVID-19 while working there, ended up taking it home to her family who also caught it. Fortunately everyone recovered but has now got to go back to work in the same place with no PPE. So we were able to provide her with these. Um, she's feeling much safer being able to go and work there now. So if anybody is able to help or knows anybody who needs help, please get involved. Cool, fantastic. Uh, so, as always, I'd like to thank our sponsors, uh, Rebel Recruiters, who have graciously provided us with uh, Zoom this evening. Uh, stickers, who provide our stickers 
Um, if you would like uh, some Dalton stickers or Agile Enjoy podcast stickers, uh, let us know and we can send those out to you. Um, failing that, when uh, normal service has resumed, uh, come see us then. Uh, we also are sponsored by JetBrains, who will be providing uh, a license, uh, product license for our giveaway later this evening. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, you can also listen to Louise, Jonathan, uh, myself, Pete Gallagher and Misha um, talk all things agile engineering, DevOps, um, leadership, all sorts of things along those uh, that end um, all on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify and various other ones. Um, just search for the Agile Engineering Podcast. Uh, this latest stuff we're actually talking about working as a distributed team, which uh, may be of use to some people. Uh, we'd be interested uh, in you guys having a listen uh, and coming back to us with your thoughts or opinions or any feedback on on the podcast as well. Um, Global DevOps Bootcamp uh, was originally scheduled to take place at the end of next month on May the 30th. However, that has now been postponed. Uh, to October 24th, uh, 24th 2020. Um, I shall be uh, helping to facilitate an event at my employer, MMT Digital, in uh, Uppingham. Um, there is an Eventbrite link that will go out shortly uh, where you can uh, book on to it. It's, it's a completely free event. It's a full day uh, where you'll take part uh, as a, well, take part in being a high performing uh, team doing things like SRE uh, and various DevOps practices and so on as well. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, there is a giveaway this evening. Um, if you would like to tweet with the hashtag DevOps Nuts, uh, you could be in with a chance of winning a, uh, a JetBrains license uh, later on tonight. Now, we are looking for speakers from July onwards uh, at this point. Uh, so if you are interested in um, speaking at DevOps Knots, uh, you can either speak to uh, Misha or myself. Um, email is on contact at devopsknots.co.uk or uh, tweet us at, at DevOps Knots. Uh, so tonight, uh, we've got two fantastic speakers for you. We've got uh, David McKay from InfluxDB. Uh, he's going to be providing a talk on what is cloud native. Uh, and a little later on, after a break, we will also have uh, Stuart Pocklington uh, giving his talk on why using the term developer makes me feel like an imposter. Uh, so I'd like to give as big a DevOps Nuts welcome as you can, uh, albeit adequately socially distant, uh, to David, uh, and I'll hand over to him. Thank you very much. So, let me share my screen. All right, can you see that, Liam? Yep, yep, perfect. Perfect, all right, let's get started. Oh, of course, my notifications start coming in now. <laughs> so this talk is a introduction to Cloud Native. Um, for the next 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you what Cloud Native is. We're going to take a look at some of the projects from the Cloud Native Foundation, which I will also explain. Uh, and I'll be happy to take any questions that people have. Uh, so this is an introductory talk, but if your question is more involved or deeper, feel free to reach out to me at the end. I don't mind getting into the nitty gritty. My name is David. Uh, hopefully, um, well, I guess you can tell that I'm Scottish by my voice. Uh, and if you can see behind me, if my video is on the screen just now, you'll see that I have some pretty big cages here. So my household is, is very um, pet friendly. We have chinchillas, dagos. There's actually a free roaming ferret who's nibbling on my toes right now, which is very off-putting. Uh, and we have a dog as well. I always say that I love esoteric programming languages. And whenever I do one of these talks you know, at a venue, I, I generally try to do a show of hands, which obviously isn't going to work under these circumstances. but um, as usually what I would say is, is anyone familiar or used a language pony? Uh, generally, the answer is no. Uh, I think it was one hand once. Really cool actor-based uh, programming language, really cool. Uh, something a little bit less esoteric would be Rust, which I've also been playing with a lot recently as well. I'm also a Kubernetes org member and help out on the release team and have been for the last year. Um, so you know, if anyone has any Kubernetes questions, feel free to throw them at me later too. Uh, my Twitter handle is right there in the middle top, raw code. Please, if you don't have time to speak to me or just aren't comfortable asking questions on this format, feel free to DM me. They are open on Twitter and I'll happily help you out. 
So let's start kind of with a little bit of history, I guess. Um, I, I guess I want to talk about at least my journey as uh, I've moved towards working on cloud native systems. Um, I've been a developer and SRE slash ops person for about 20 years now. So I started in the dangerous world of bare metal. And obviously, scale was a, a huge issue. Um, I used to work for an e-commerce company. And what we used to do, whenever we had seasonal or cyclic like demand for our, our online presence, we'd actually just go out and buy new machines and then sell them the following week. Not exactly the best way to scale your infrastructure, but this was the 90s slash early 2000s. And then cloud computing became a thing and we started to push everything towards these horizontally scalable solutions using virtualization on the cloud, which is obviously still going very, very strong. Loads of people are, are doing this path. And eventually you start to hit pain points with cloud computing too. And it's generally because they're VM based and VMs have a few challenges. Um, there seems to be, I guess, two schools of thought here. One is people go down building you know, golden images, which are really fast to deploy, but they're not as flexible as actually real-time provisioning. Uh, and those two camps are obviously very different approaches to solving the same problem. And they, they both come with very different trade-offs that have to be made for how quickly you can respond to traffic on your website. And I think this is what drove the needs and requirements for something like you know, Docker and other container technologies, which pushed us towards the container native movement. It was very brief. In fact, I don't even think the term container native was particularly used a lot, but it's generally where a lot of people are now. Um, at least the conversations I have with people at events is that everyone has now started to you know, adopt containers and use them as part of their deployment workflow. But not a lot of those companies and, and teams are actually pushing through to that final final goal that we have right now of cloud native. And I'm going to include uh, serverless or functions as a service within the cloud native bracket, at least for now. But a lot of people have got to container native and that's working really well for them. And they haven't went that last mile to really get forward to cloud native. So what is cloud native? Well, the term I think was actually just coined by the foundation, um, which was, it's actually a subsidiary of the Linux Foundation. It was formed and announced when Kubernetes hit 1.0 in 2015. Uh, and it's big. <laughs> there are a lot of members in the Cloud Native Foundation. You know, I've listed a couple here, but I think, you know, just the fact that there are over 450 members, which means companies are actively paying money to this foundation, shows that even though a lot of people aren't pushing through to being actually cloud native systems, is that the actual um, the movement, the project, uh, and the projects that they manage are all vitally important to where we're moving to in the software industry. So what does the Cloud Native Foundation actually define as cloud native? Well, they break it down into three different components that all applications must adhere to to be considered cloud native. Now, the first one is a no-brainer. It has to be containerized. Right? Every, every part, every segment, every component of your cloud native application must be purpose-built to run inside of a container. Right? The second quality that they deem to be of a cloud native system is that the orchestration of those containers has to be dynamic. Uh, we're going to talk about Kubernetes today because it's kind of the linchpin of all of the different tools that are available from the CNCF that really make adopting or building cloud native systems um, possible. And the third component of a cloud native system is that it has to be microservices, right? You can't just take your monolithic application that you've been working on for the last six years, 10 years, 20 years, however long, you know, write a Docker file that's 14 gig in size and deploy that to Kubernetes and say it's cloud native now, right? The way that we build these systems is changing rapidly and microservices are a key component of what is considered cloud native application. So why do we need these things? Now, hopefully containerization is the easy one here. There are a lot of benefits to deploying your application as a container. Now, if you've been uh, working on software long enough, then, you know, we always joke about it works in my machine, but these are things that we used to say on a daily basis to our colleagues or our customers. Um, to just deny that the problem was real. And that the challenges there were our, our programming languages and frameworks, the runtimes of choice, have generally always been quite good at encapsulation dependencies 
uh, encapsulating dependencies for the application, but they always stopped there, right? They never really went forward and defined what was actually required on the operating system. It's not as common anymore with languages like Go, which, you know, compiled the static binaries. But there usually used to be a lot of shared libraries that were needed for your application to work correctly. And adopting container technologies, and I'll just use Docker specifically at the moment, but the Docker file allows us to actually say, my application depends on this operating system with this, um, with these different dependencies, and you know, I want my disk to look like this, and all these other things. So you were able to actually encapsulate all dependencies from the application to the operating system. Uh, and that gave us a parity across our environments as two. Another really common problem from you know 10 years ago or longer was, you know, we have dev environments, we have staging environments, we have production environments, we have local dev environments. Uh, they're all very, very different. Uh, we don't want them to be, but the same version of PHP that we have running in production rarely matched up with what was shipped with your, you know, Ubuntu machine or your Mac or whatever. So having that parity across all of those environments is crucial. And of course, containers give us isolation as well. Right? So we actually, just by adopting containers, can remove many different attack vectors that are present in our infrastructure. Um, you know, I used to write a lot of PHP over the last 20 years and or any web application, I guess, would actually suffer from this. But you know, if you're a website that accepts file uploads, that is your biggest attack vector. The minute any bad actor can get anything executed through the upload folder, there is a real danger to that entire environment. And just by using containers, we can, you know, we have isolation of the processes that that bad actor can see, the mounts are different or virtualized from the host, and then the network itself is even virtualized. And even just taking it a step further, containers can be run with a read-only file system that locks everything specifically to a very, you know, to your uploads directory. So even if they do get to execute that script, they can't modify any of the system. So containers, no brainer, we should all be adopting them. Uh, cool, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> so, then I'm like orchestrating. Why do we want this? Right? And I always equate this to playing Tetris with your services. Again, from my own experience, especially working in e-commerce in the late '90s, is that servers and infrastructure is expensive. Uh, and when you're coming from a monolithic background, you know, generally running a single service on a single machine and scaling it up in that kind of fashion uh, is not going to be efficient, or you know, resource utilization is going to be very, very poor. So dynamic orchestration actually allows us to specify, you know, to the best guesstimate that we have, what resource constraints each of our services or applications require and allow the scheduler to actually work out what is available, again, on a guesstimate on each of those nodes and schedule our work in a bin packing fashion. So we're going to get much better efficiency and hopefully at the same time reduce our costs. And dynamic orchestrated also just means managed. Right. So I don't know how familiar people are with Kubernetes here, but Kubernetes is just a whole collection of controllers that monitor desired state and compare that to what's actually in existence and do their best to reconcile that for you. So we're constantly looking through to make sure that your infrastructure, your applications, all of that is as you need it to be. And it will make certain um, steps and measures to make sure that that happens. And microservices. Um, <laughs> love or hate them, it's very divided and not everyone enjoys working in microservices, but there is a definitely a lure to them, right? I mean, as a developer, the idea that I can take a piece of functionality such as um, logging in or registering for uh, an application and confine that to its own individual service where it's only got one entry point, you know, one set of inputs, one set of outputs and test that very well has a certain draw to it. And if I structure my organization correctly, of course, we've got things that Conway's law to worry about, that if I have teams are truly autonomous and can deploy on their own schedule without consulting anyone else, then there's a certain degree of agility that comes in the velocity through that as well. And of course, there's maintainability. <laughs> Whenever people talk about microservices, there's always this kind of uh, I don't want to say like proverb, I don't know. Um, or people say that you don't maintain microservices, you replace. And the goal being if they're small enough that you can just rewrite it, maybe the language that you chose the first time around wasn't fit for purpose, maybe you got the spec wrong regardless, um, you can just rewrite that service, uh, get it correct. And because we have containerization and dynamic orchestration, we can even deploy both of those services at the same time and do fancy things around that too.
So cloud native is those three different components that we need to strive and aim for within our applications. Now, I'm just going to be a, a little bit lighthearted for a moment here. And I don't mean to pick on JavaScript, but there was this wonderful example that I came across when I was given this talk uh, about three years ago now. Um, and microservices at their core should be small enough that they don't actually have any dependencies, right? They definitely should not depend on other services. But there's a package in JavaScript called as even. And anyone that has you know, ever used a modulus operator before would know that this function would work, right? This is a very valid way to write an as even function. However, the JavaScript version of this doesn't do that. It actually has a dependency on a package called as odd and returns the invert of that. Now, I don't want to say that that's wrong, but it's pretty close to wrong as it's going to get, right? This is <laughs> for something that should be four lines of functions. And micro, this is, of course, this is a microservice. It's a package that can be consumed, right? And there's different trade offs that they've made here, but it just doesn't seem like it's complicated to warn a dependency. And actually, the as odd function itself has another dependency on as number. So, you know, there's, there's a daisy chain of dependencies from these three really trivial functions, which only take a few, a few lines of code to write. Um, and this is just something you should be cautious of with microservices, you know, do not have dependencies, keep them really simple. Um, you're just gonna have a better time. So there is dangers ahead, microservices, cloud native, dynamic orchestration and containers. There are a world of challenges ahead of you. And this is why the Cloud Native Foundation exists. So what does cloud native mean for me to summarize? is that we're aiming for simplicity as much as possible for developers to be able to write their functionality, their services, and their applications in a set of isolated, ad impotent um, services, but potentially hellish for SREs and operators and infrastructure engineers and DevOps professionals to be able to handle the complexity of the network and the infrastructure that's required to actually run these simple services. And, you know, the complexity that is being removed from the developer's microservices. You know, it's really easy to write a function that takes one input, one output, and does it. But all that complexity has to go somewhere. And the infrastructure is where that all ends up. So what complexities am I talking about? Well, the minute that we have a cloud native application, what we actually have is a distributed application. And for a distributed application to work, we have to have a whole bunch of other components within our infrastructure. Something like service discovery. When I break down a monolithic application from a, you know, from a single monolith to be two services, four services, 12 services, a thousand services, those services do need to be able to discover each other, communicate over message buses, communicate through gRPC, communicate over HTTP, depending on what's going on there. And because we have all of these remote distributed networking calls, there's also the challenge of authentication across all of those different calls. Can I trust that this service that is calling this service is actually the service that it claims to be? Hmm, who knows? And then there's secrets. Right? There's a whole lot of complex infrastructure and secrets aren't unique. I don't know if you can hear my dog there, but sorry about that. <laughs> there's someone delivering a parcel. But secrets aren't unique to a cloud native environment. Um, this is a challenge that comes from regardless of environment. And then deployments, you know, with microservices, we have to be able to deploy dozens to hundreds of times uh, per day, per week, per month, depending on how far down that trail we are. And then that even makes observability and monitoring, logging, metrics, all of that has to improve drastically. It's really easy to observe a system that is a monolith, right? We can deploy it. We have some core metrics, maybe the red method, the golden signals, anything like that. We monitor utilization of the CPU, the memory, the disk, nice and simple. But the minute you have a distributed application where you can't always determine root cause, you can't always determine which service is failing, there's cascading problems. There is a world of heart waiting there when you adopt cloud native systems. So we have to improve our monitoring, our observability and all of that as well. And because this is a distributed application, there's a lot of networking requests. So does each of our microservices have to implement their own exponential backoff and retry logic? 
or do we push that down to the infrastructure as well? So the complexity of a cloud-native system really start to show when we talk about the infrastructure that is required for that cloud-native application to run successfully. So this is where the cloud-native foundation comes in. Their role, their mandate is to sponsor and help projects that provide solutions or guidance on all of those complexities so that we don't have to manage that ourselves. You know, the founding project was Kubernetes. It handles service discovery, orchestration. It has secret management. Of course, we can talk about that later if anyone wants to get into it, which is a major chunk of the problem. We then have FluentD and Prometheus, which gives us log collection and metrics for our distributed application. And we have OpenTelemetry, which is a new amalgamation of a couple of other open source projects that aim to make the observability of these services almost trivial. Um, it's still beta, but they're making really good progress so that developers don't have to fight tooth and nail to make their systems work this way. Other projects will include Linkerd and Envoy, um, Service Mesh and Networking. This handles the retry logic, the fault injection, uh, security aspects of all those networking problems. We have Containerd for running the containers and Core DNS, which gives us named discovery of services. So the, the foundation itself is really making sure that these projects can succeed and have the support that they need for us to write cloud-native applications. But those are, oh, <laughs> those are just the projects that the CNCF sponsors. There are many, many projects out there. There are many, in fact, uh, there's over a thousand, I think the number is, and this is the landscape drawing from the Cloud-Native Foundation. So there are, each one of these squares is a project that provides something that claims to help Cloud-Native developers do their job. Um, I can't remember the last time I sat and went through each of these because it's just too much there, right? But here are the highlights. There are 1,382 different products that are part of the CNCF landscape document, which equates to over 2 million stars on GitHub. And then the market cap and the funding of the companies behind those projects. So the cloud native ecosystem is huge. And as more and more of us are making this transition to microservices and eventually cloud native, these are the tools that are gonna to help us get there along the way. But I'm only going to focus on a few of the projects from the CNCF today. We're going to take a look at Kubernetes, uh, just briefly look at FluentD and Prometheus, uh, OpenTelemetry, and Linkerd. And I just want to kind of talk about what they actually help us achieve. Uh, and then we'll talk about the migration path. So how do I make that journey from monolithic to cloud native? So we kind of covered this, but Kubernetes offers dynamic orchestration. So all that bin packing, the scheduling, and the state reconciliation is there for us. It has a concept of a deployment. So it gives us the facilities to do rolling upgrades or kill or you know, stop the world upgrades. We have the service discovery, secret management and configurations. <coughs> and I mean, Kubernetes is a beast. Uh, it has so many different components. It's constantly evolving. You know, there's a release pretty much every quarter. Uh, but just always think about Kubernetes as a, just a while loop in a code. It's essentially saying, well, loop forever, check the desired state, see what the developer wants, and then try and make whatever change I can to make that happen. So if we take a look at a manifest, everything in Kubernetes is driven through YAML uh, manifests. But we have here a type deployment, which allows us to scale any arbitrary container that we can build for our, our application. So we can see here that we have my container. It's got some sort of name and a a tag shout on the end of it. And scaling in Kubernetes comes down to a simple key value pair inside of the spec. If I want to be able to run three, 12, or 100 of these, all I need to do is change that number after replicas. And Kubernetes is going to go and handle that for me. That's what I mean by state reconciliation. If I say I want 100 of these, it's going to keep looping and checking how many there are and continually try to schedule more and more and more until I hit the desired number of replicas that I want. The service discovery aspect happens through a service object inside Kubernetes. Here, I'm just specifying a selector. That just means go and find all of the containers or pods inside of the uh, Kubernetes system that has a uh, label with the, type, the, the name name and the value my deployment. And I'm going to expose that on a node port, which just means expose it on a fixed port number on every machine on the cluster. 
And that just works. What's really, really cool about this from a Kubernetes point of view is that this service is available internally as well inside the Kubernetes system on the name, which isn't actually visible on the screen here, but inside of the spec, I have a metadata on the name and that DNS name is created for me and available. So if I have a deployment called Nginx and a service called Nginx that selects that deployment, hitting HTTP colon slash slash Nginx is always going to pull me up a pod from that service. And you just get this for free as you start to adopt and explore Kubernetes. And another thing that's really important is configuration. And, and, and Kubernetes, we have an object type called a config map, which has a name. And then any arbitrary key value pairs can go inside of this config map. And now you can actually store entire files as the values on the right-hand side of the keys. Um, and what's really important here is something I'm going to talk about a, a little bit um, shortly too, is 12-factor applications. And that we actually really only ever want to build a Docker image once, regardless of the environment that we deploy it to. And we want to drive as much of that configuration for, per, uh, for each environment and the environment itself. And that would be done through things like a config map. So don't hard code. Don't have a .dev.com for a prod.yaml in your application and change the DNS name. Because that means that your environment configuration requires you to commit to the application, do a new build, and build in your container. And there are a few problems with that approach. Uh, now, so if you're going to write Kubernetes manifests, the, I like to think the golden rule is, you know, only write manifests for code that you control and you own. For everything else, you always use Helm. And Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes, much like app get on uh, Debian and Ubuntu systems, chocolate on Windows, whatever your um, preferences. And Helm has an a very far reaching and wide ecosystem of contributors that are continually building and deploying their operational knowledge for these pieces of software and storing them in the Helm charts that we can consume as developers. So I don't know anything about running and operating Postgres in production. I don't know anything about operating and running MariaDB in production, but many people in the open source community do. And they're continually pushing that experience into these Helm charts so that I can take advantage of it. And it's really, really easy. Uh, it was actually by chance that the three examples that I wanted to put into the slide here just all happened to be maintained by the Bitnami repository. That wasn't uh, something I planned to do. But using Helm, I can just say, give me a MariaDB, give me a Redis, give me a WordPress install. And I don't have to know anything about how that works. The people that maintain the Helm charts do all of the heavy lifting, and I just get to take advantage of it as a curious developer. <clears throat> and so I do like to condition that. Uh, there are some instances where you will need to write manifests, even if you don't own the software. Databases can be one of them, even though they're also the biggest uh, advantage of Helm charts, because databases are naturally hard to maintain in production. So use your own judgment there, but generally if there's a Helm chart available and it gives you enough flexibility through the configuration, you should always take advantage of it. Another project from the Cloud Native Foundation is, is FluentD, and it's a log collector which can give you a very quick path to centralizing your logging. It isn't always that easy. And again, this is a combination of Kubernetes and FluentD, not something that you get by using FluentD on its own. But there are two different variants of Fluent, Fluent D. There's also Fluent Bit. Uh, and I just want to quickly talk about what the differences there are. So Fluent D is written in Ruby. And it has a very wide selection of plugins that are available to you. And Fluent Bit is written in C, which means it has a lot less plugins. But depending on what you need from your environment, pick the one that fits best for you. So as you can see here, Fluent D actually scales relatively well, um, hitting around 13,000 events per second but it does consume 45 megs of RAM. And that may not be a lot. And again, it comes down to just how much work it's doing. But if you're in a more confined environment, then Fluent Bit can do the exact same kind of level of log shipping with under half a meg of a memory footprint. So there are caveats there. It depends on what plugins you need. It depends how fast you, have, you need it to be and if you're in a memory constrained environment. But two really, really cool projects that give you a lot of flexibility. And you don't really need to do an awful lot to take advantage of this either. So uh, <laughs> uh, 
uh, how do you centralize your logs on a Kubernetes environment? Well, the easiest thing you can do, in fact, the only thing you have to do is just log to standard out, right? This hasn't changed from that container native approach that we're, you know, a lot more people have already adopted compared to the cloud native approach. But you don't log to fails anymore. You just log to standard out and allow the infrastructure and, and Kubernetes itself to help you shift that stuff around. So yeah, log to standard out, Helm install Fluent D. It runs as a daemon set. So what actually happens is the Fluent D or Fluent Bit runs on every node in your Kubernetes machine. Kubernetes is already shipping your standard out logs to a file. It knows where to find them and it will centralize them to Elasticsearch. It can centralize them to Greylog. It can centralize them to CloudWatch. Whatever you choose to use, it has a plugin which will allow you to get your logs there. This is one of my favorite things about this whole Kubernetes thing, I think. Because <laughs> log management used to be such a pain in the hoop. And, uh, never mind. That's another story. Then uh, Prometheus. So this is where thing, I guess, maybe it's a little weird for some people if you're familiar with the company I work for. But I work for a company called Influx Data. We're actually an open source time series database called InfluxDB. Uh, Prometheus would be considered one of our competitors. But when I give this talk, I always like to focus on Prometheus because it is a CNCF project and it is a graduated project along with Kubernetes. The two just go hand in hand together and there are a lot of benefits from using them both together. Um, and I say here that metric consumption shouldn't be this easy and I really do mean that. So what is Prometheus? Well, it's a time series database. It's written in Go, so it's statically compiled and it is a pool-based metric collection system, which means that it, it doesn't, uh, there are no push rules, right? Your application doesn't need to know where to put those metrics to. Instead, Prometheus just has to be able to discover those endpoints and scrape them for you. And this works really well with Kubernetes because we have service discoveries. Uh, we have service, service discovery for services, and we already have the ability to label and annotate all the workloads within the cluster. So how does this work? Well, as a developer, your service, you add a metrics endpoint, and then you annotate that deployment with Prometheus.io slash scrape true. And what that means is that any Prometheus within the cluster can scan the pods for the annotation, go hit the metrics endpoint, consume your metrics, and then they're centralized as well. Another really cool part in here is to deploy something as a sidecar that either exposes the metrics or consumes them. So you can take advantage of caching rules and push stuff. But that's another topic as well. So there's a lot of flexibility and Prometheus as a time series database within the Kubernetes ecosystem. And what do the metrics look like as my application? Well, it's a strictly text protocol. So you don't need to do anything fancy. You can just add a new endpoint and start to output metrics in the format that we have on the screen. We start with some sort of metric or measurement name on the left. And then inside of the braces, we have tag values that allows us to filter any of the metrics in the TSDP. And then on the right-hand side, we have a value. So whether we're tracking the active users per region, whether we want to track the CPU usage across different operating system types, or whether we actually want to track the response buckets, depending on we consider 30 milliseconds or 500 milliseconds to be healthy, we can do all of that too. This is the Prometheus exposition format, um, although there is a newer format called Open Metrics, and I don't think that's hit GA yet. Um, Prometheus is cool from the database side, uh, but if you don't want to write your own metrics endpoint page yourself, then another CNCF project comes in called OpenTelemetry, which actually makes it really easy to produce these metrics as well. Uh, now it has had a few names or at least a few projects have merged in the last kind of 12 to 18 months. Uh, there was a project called Open Census. There's a project called Open Tracing. They both had very similar goals in mind. Open Tracing wanted to make distributed tracing commodity. Open Census wanted to make monitoring uh, frameworks and language and runtimes just as, as trivial. And when you put them together, you actually get a full-fledged observability system for your application and runtime with very little effort. And <clears throat> excuse me. And what's really great about this is that it doesn't favor any one vendor. So regardless if you're using New Relic or Datadog as one of the SaaS providers, if you're using InfluxDB or Prometheus and you're inside your own cluster, or you're using one of the cloud things like CloudWatch or StackDriver, OpenTelemetry is going to work with all of those. In fact, it can actually work with multiple, which solves the age-old problem of how do you monitor your monitoring. 
Now, because it's obviously not a, it's not an easy system to write. So there are only certain integrations with certain languages and frameworks at the moment. But this is a pretty large chunk of most of the popular programming languages that people are using in container native and cloud native development. You know, a large chunk of that is Go developers, and that's supported as a first class citizen. We've got a lot of Python, JavaScript, Ruby, all the other languages there. Obviously, if you're using something esoteric like Pony, there's not going to be that support and you will have to build it yourself. But there are still really good APIs and agents and collectors that you can leverage even if the language runtime and integration isn't there specifically. And there are a few larger languages that are currently a work in progress. Uh, my experience is PHP, so it's nice to know that there's ongoing work there. And of course, Swift and .NET as a, a collection of languages are also going to have support from the open telemetry ecosystem as well. And the, the way that you build this is you consume open telemetry as a dependency in your application, and it gives you a certain set of APIs. So it gives you a log system that allows you to write logs. It gives you the ability to export metrics of various types, whether those be histograms, gauges, or just counters. Um, and then there's all the distributed tracing. So every time you make an HTTP call, you can actually fire off the start and end events to the open telemetry collector and actually be able to visualize all of the HTTP traffic across your distributed application as well. So that is beta. There's not been a production grade release yet. But I would expect this to happen very soon. And some of the languages do have a very, very good support. So um, check it out. The GitHub pages have all the details that you need. So that's some of the more important projects that you really need to be familiar with as you want to take on cloud native architecture in your application. But what actually needs to happen from a developer point of view in order to adopt cloud native systems? I'm going to try and do that in six easy steps. So I call this the shit system. Um, wasn't intentional, but then I would just decide to roll with it. But your application has to be able to scale horizontally. And that's not just from an infrastructure point of view. I'm talking about the number of people in your team, the way that your teams communicate, the way that your teams ship code. The code itself has to be able to scale that way. There's a lot of things you have to get right from the get-go, which we'll talk about, in order for this to work as a cloud native architecture. Add and potency is really, really important. You have to have confidence in your deployments and you have to be able to trust that no matter how many times you do something, there's not going to be side effects. And you know, I've mentioned this a few times now, but observability, understanding how your application works in production is vitally important. Right? It's not a monolith. You can't just monitor the CPU of the box that it's on. You need to have you know, a way to evaluate the health of the system as a whole and not just the individual components. And then trust, right? When things go wrong, you need to trust the system to be able to fix it for you. That's relying on Kubernetes state reconciliation. And finally, just simplicity. And we'll talk about that too. So when I talk about scaling horizontally, there's this thing called the 12-factor app, uh, which lists out a whole bunch of rules about how to write container native systems. And they are still the same rules that are in place for writing a cloud native system. Now, I'm hoping that being 2020, saying that you should use version control is not going to be something scary for you. I think most of us are using Git now. So as long as just all your code is in uh, any version control, then you've ticked that box and I'm happy. Then we get down to dependencies. I know some languages haven't always had a package manager, cough, cough, go. But there are at least a way that allows us to be sure of the dependencies that we have at build time. Um, other languages do this much better. PHP has Composer, I missed an R there. But really, really good. Ruby has gems, Python has pips, and so forth. But having all of those dependencies explicitly defined, and again, using the Docker file to clearly specify the operating system level dependencies as well, is crucial to being a 12-factor application. And just-in-time configuration, you know, whenever you feel yourself uh, having some sort of state machine or multiple configuration files inside of your Git repository to handle those environments, you're making this kind of arbitrary rule that your code base needs to know how many environments there are. And that shouldn't really be the case. You should have the flexibility without pushing anything to Git, GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera to spin up a new environment. And all of the configuration for the URLs, the APIs, the TLS certificates should all exist in the environment and not your code. Another really important aspect of the 12-factor uh, 12, uh, 12 app 
is to separate your build, release, and run pipeline. It's very, very common for people to have one CI pipeline that does all of them at the same time, or not at the same time, but you know, in a serial fashion. And there are three very distinct steps. You know, we should be able to build an image and distribute it. We shouldn't have to rebuild that image depending on the environment we wish to deploy to. Releasing is a very specific step that we choose to do on an automated basis or manual basis. And then running that in the environment is, again, separating these out from continuous integration, current uh, continuous deployment, really important. And disposability is another really important aspect of this kind of manifesto, and is that we have to expect failures, and we have to make sure that we have the infrastructure and the code in place to be able to handle those failures, log those failures, and deal with those failures. And logging, I mean, in the 20 years I've been writing code, I've written some horrendous log messages in my applications. And it's really, you know, it's something that I don't think you ever really get better at until you, you focus on it specifically. But try and remember that your log output from your application is not just for debugging as you deal with problems in a development cycle, but it's actually an audit trail or an event stream of things that help you understand how that application works in a real production environment. So always try to use your logs as structured logs as possible uh, and talk about what happened, what, what function was called, what parameters were passed rather than the outputs of those functions. And your logs will instantly become a lot more valuable. At importance, you always, always, always want to build once. And I can't kind of hammer that home enough. Please, if you have a pipeline where you build an image for development and then you rebuild it for production, you have no idea what is going to change between those two artifacts. And that can cause you endless amount of problems. If you're using uh, Docker, avoid the latest tag as much as possible. Use commit shaz as tags or use the uh, any shad that you can get, anything unique to that very specific set of files on the disk it can even be the container layer shad. If you do have base images, um, something I see very, very frequently is that people decide to take the, the official Debian or the Ubuntu image, they make a few changes to it in a repo over here, and they don't build that for six months, a year, longer but their application is rebuilding every day on top of that. And what they don't realize is that because they're consuming that as a base, you're now six months, 12 months, or 18 months behind on any security updates from that base image. So make sure that you always trigger you know, daily builds, weekly builds of any base image you've got. And if you are using Docker, using build kit and multi-stage builds, it's going to get you so much value and bang for your buck. So you know, if you have to compile an extension or a shared library or anything like that, you can use multi-stage layers to pull in all of your build dependencies and then just pull one file from each layer into your actual production image. And if you're doing any static builds, this is invaluable for cutting down the size of your images as well. You know, we don't want to see production Docker images that are gigs in size. We want to see them much, much, much smaller. Intelligence, this is the observability bit, right? Um, if you need SSH on your machines in order to debug a problem, to me, that is a really big red flag. It means that you've got information and debuggability information that you need to centralize somewhere. So if you can, try removing SSH and see how long that lasts. Um, but it will, you will very quickly realize where the problems are in your observability pipeline. Uh, when it comes to logging, using JSON as an output so that you can parse that in code really, really powerful as well, right? You don't have to just output random text. You can actually encode your logs as, as JSON structures so that code and machines can understand it. As much as the logs are there for you to understand the system, the first use case is always gonna be machines. Metrics are vital. We need to understand what normal looks like. You know, When we see load averages and memory consumptions for applications, there's nothing immediately that tells you, oh, this database is consuming 90 gigs of RAM. Is that bad? Well, I don't know. How long has it been running? How, is that a spike? Like, you really need to use time series. You need to use databases and metric systems that allow you to analyze these metrics over days, weeks, months, and years. In fact, the longer you have that data, the much better uh, statistical functions you're going to have available to do predictions and forecasting and anomaly detection. And that's why TSDBs are so important. Yeah. And of course, tracing. Because it is a distributed application, if we, if we don't have distributed tracing to understand which service is speaking to which service, it's really difficult to understand where those dependencies are. 
it's really difficult to debug a cascading error, but with tracing, we can actually identify which calls between which services, which headers, and which parameters, and break that down into you know, you know, histograms or distribution buckets to allow us to understand and debug those a lot quicker than we would through just generic log data. Uh, and finally, trust, or maybe second finally, we'll see. <laughs> but you need to always make sure that you're writing automated test feeds, right? When it comes to automation, you know, you've got to really rely on these systems. Like parity is such a big deal. Um, if my development and production system are not as close as I can get to possible, and then by that, you know, if that's a Docker image, then that's as close as I'm going to get. That's great. But feel free to test in production, right? I know it's got a lot of stigma against that whole process, but sometimes it's the only way. Uh, and you should feel you should feel uncomfortable deploying on a Friday, but by trusting the automation and getting comfortable with that, you're actually going to be able to improve your deployment experience across the board. Uh, oh, simplicity, yes. So <laughs> this cloud native systems are really simple for developers. Right? It's really easy to write forty lines of JavaScript or, or Python and have a service that works. And what the cloud native ecosystem wants to do is bring that same simplicity to the operational aspect of all of these systems. And hopefully you can see that from the, you know, the software that we spoke about. And although we haven't dived into them uh, deeply at all, just knowing that they're there, knowing what they're for, knowing what, what they provide is hopefully enough to make this journey a lot easier for you. And Kubernetes is the base here for everything. Every project we've got here would not exist without Kubernetes without the tools and the, the declarative manifest and the annotations and the labels and that whole reconciliation loop is what makes all of this possible. But networking, this is where things get a little bit trickier um, because we don't want to have the network be the problem part of a cloud native system. In fact, we, we want to make the network as simple as possible too. And this is where service meshes come in. And I'm going to talk about Linkerd here because it is a cloud native project. But the whole concept of a service mesh is trying to bring that same level of simplicity that the developers have for microservices, that Kubernetes and surrounding technologies are trying to provide for operators, and then do the same for the networking aspect of it. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of the really cool features from the service mesh uh, interface. Uh, so Linkerd is a CNCF project as a service mesh, but implements an interface that most other service meshes are now adopting. And one of the really cool things there is we can automatically retries from a declarative fashion and a YAML file. So we run Linkerd in our network, our application speaks to Linkerd and it says, go and speak to this service. If that request fails, Linkerd will automatically retry that request until it succeeds or hits the retry budget. So I don't need any code as a developer to get automatic retries for free. And that includes things like Ice Manager Backoff as well. And I can just say for any get method, maybe we don't trust the post or whatever, but I can say this is retriable and I'm going to allow a maximum of 10 retries per second. And Linkerd will handle that for me. What about mutual TLS authentication, right? This is a major pain point, very difficult to provision this in a production environment. But Linkerd does this for you as well. By running Linkerd as a sidecar for our Kubernetes workloads, it will actually enforce MTLS across all of our traffic. Uh, obviously, the caveats are there because you know TLS, MTLS is only going to work if we're using actual DNS names and not IP addresses. And it only works for HTTP traffic just now, but I know they are working on that as well. And another really cool benefit from adopting service meshes in Linkerd is the fact that we can do traffic shaping and traffic splitting. And that just means we have blue-green deployments that become a, a four lines of YAML in a manifest or Canadian deployments, where we can say, we actually want to deploy two different versions of this application, and we're going to ship 90% of our traffic to the green instance and 10% to the blue instance. And we get a lot of this just by leveraging Linkerd and Kubernetes and a few lines of YAML. So while the network is still the biggest pain point of cloud native applications, it is getting a lot easier through tools like Linkerd and Istio. Another really cool thing about these service meshes tools is that because they are controlling the network, they also do the telemetry or the distribu distributed tracing too. So most of these service meshes usually use Envoy. It has the ability to log to Jaeger and Zipkin, which are distributed tracing tools. And 
we don't actually need to instrument the open telemetry aspects of our code ourselves. We can allow the service mesh that is sitting as a sidecar do that automatically, which is really, really cool. So now that you've learned all about these projects, you know roughly what cloud native is, and I spoke a little bit about the challenges involved, when can you consider yourself to be cloud native? Um, now, other than me just being a huge Rick and Morty fan and looking for any excuse to use this image in all of my slide decks ever, when you're staring down the barrel of a broken or 10 broken microservices, and your answer is, I need one more service to fix this, I would like to consider that is when you're cloud native. So thank you very much. I hope this was a kind of gentle, but interesting introduction to the cloud native uh, landscape. And I'd be happy to take any questions anyone has. Uh, you, should, you should all now be able to unmute yourselves if you do have a question. Um, you might even have the raise, I know the raise hand thing doesn't work in here at the moment, does it? At least it wasn't for me earlier. Um, Jonathan, I thought you uh, had a question to ask. Find the, find the unmute button. Um, yeah, no, it was, it's two questions. One with, I think with nearly the 14, 1,400 options that you talked about earlier that the CNCF talk about, do you think that the fact that they pick a few to champion is being fair to all who contribute to it or is it just helpful for people wanting to get started uh yes yeah, so i think there are definitely a few a few things there so th i don't think that the cncf is championing the projects which are under its umbrella per se um, it's more that those projects are ones that were widely adopted by the community and offered up to the cncf for governorship um, you know, whereas a lot of the landscape projects, you know, of those 1400, although a lot of them are open source, they are generally corporate span sponsored. Uh, and those corporate sponsors generally are not in a position to give up the IP of that to a foundation, generally. Like Estio, for as a, a really good example, is the most popular uh, service mesh in the cloud native landscape right now. But Google are still holding on to the IP of that, Google and IBM, I believe. So um, I don't. I think the sponsored ones by the CNCF are great because you know they're going to be continued to be supported, but uh, the landscape also has some really good options too. Uh, does that help? <laughs> yep, absolutely. Uh, I have a question. Um, how is this? How is the Cloud Native um, Foundation, Community Foundation, um, impacting upon the major cloud players? I mean, obviously Amazon, uh, AWS, and, and Azure in terms of their PaaS offerings and standardization interoperability, um, the picture you've painted there is almost that you have a raw cluster that you put in and your entire solution. But for a lot of us, we're working with out of the box PaaS services. Is it, what, what, what participation is there in, uh, with those providers? Yeah, I mean, Microsoft and, and Google are definitely CNCF members. I, I can't remember if Amazon are, but there is really good support. Um, you know, all three cloud providers do have an implementation of the service mesh interface. They all run a version of a managed but compliant Kubernetes system, which means that the CNCF has got a standard that says this is, I don't have to change the way developers work in order to work with this cluster. And the cloud participation there is generally good across the board. So as, uh, the two areas I think I see the most are service mesh and uh, Kubernetes standardization. But hopefully that would come to others as well. Have you got any others at the mind? Obviously, yes. I mean, uh, you, you cited very Kubernetes specific. Are there any other areas though that you're seeing? Yeah, there are, there are two projects on the CNCF that I'd like to see broader adoption of. One of them being cloud events. Um, so that's a format or specification for messages crossing between the network, um, mm. which is really important. Uh, and of course, the open telemetry stuff. I would like to see open metrics exposition format really take off and become a standard for metrics across uh, clouds and other open source projects uh, and open telemetry from a tracing point of view as well. I think there's some standardization there that would be beneficial that allows people to pick and choose the tools um, that work for them. Do you, just as a, a supplementary question, do you think though that there's some commercial concerns that it, this this could be making things more cloud portable so you can shift your workloads? <laughs> 
Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's definitely a challenge. Obviously, vendor lock-in is, is, I mean, I don't think Amazon are shy in saying they really want you to embrace their ecosystem and the, the, the benefit that they will offer. You know, it's, it's lock-in, but you get a lot of draw there. Um, I don't know. That's a tricky, a tricky one. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I've got a, a, a quick question, actually, if uh, it's all right with folks. Um, so um, what would you say to somebody who sort of wants to uh, like lift and shift their legacy system to the cloud by sort of just throwing it in a container or at Kubernetes and hoping for the best? You can definitely do it. Like, um, at least by taking, you know, if you've got a monolithic application and you stick it in a container image and you can deploy that to Kubernetes, you're not going to see any of the benefits from running your application on Kubernetes. But you are in a much better position where you can begin to iterate and take advantage of those benefits. So, you know, if you're using like the strangler pattern where you take a small portion of your monolithic application, you extract the API, you satisfy it with a new service, and you can use the service mesh to root or API gateways to root those requests specifically to the new service, then you can start to really leverage and um, and hopefully break down that monolith as painlessly as it's going to be, although there's going to be a lot of hurt. Um, so, you, I mean, you can go that down that route, but there's going to be a lot of expense there. Um, you know, just using a managed Kubernetes service, assuming you don't want to run it all yourself, um, you've got to pay for those infrastructure, you've probably got it running side by side with your legacy infrastructure. Um, so you're going to take a hit on cost, you're going to take a hit on development time, you're going to have to bring in a whole bunch of new technologies like the API gateway, the service mesh, but the benefits will pay off longer term as you do start to extract that functionality out. Cool, thank you. Um, is there any more questions from the floor uh, before we go into our break? Uh, I have a question. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I uh, wanted to ask about uh, the service mesh thing. So um, the question is, uh, if suppose uh, somebody um, has gone to Kubernetes, um, say from a legacy or something, and they wanted to um, first try the networking as native networking or service mesh. So which which will be the easiest way or the less friction uh, when we take in terms of all concerns like security and design and everything. So what will you suggest is the the um, the right way or um, the easiest way? <laughs> oh, I'm actually not really sure how to answer that question. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure. We can talk in the chat box. Uh, I'll need to think about that one for a moment, I'm afraid. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Uh, any further questions? Okay. Um, so it's uh, 7.45 now. So we'll take a quick 10-minute uh, break for a uh, comfort break, people to get um, a cup of tea, quick uh, bite to eat. Um, something slightly stronger um and uh we'll reconvene at five two um obviously feel free to to stay uh here at this point um we'll and continue yeah, conversation and stuff um with with the folks that are here we're going to continue streaming um and uh go from there if i can do Oh, that was really good, David. We've uh, we've just started to use LinkedIn in some projects at work, in fact, um, and it's, it's by far my preferred service mesh out of the few I've looked at, just because it's so easy to use. Oh yeah, the uh, SDO requires a lot of patience. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, I think I, I got I very quickly got to the end of my patience with it. I was like, nope, I'm going to use something else. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's, I mean, Linkerd is a lot more opinionated and like you just, as long as you're happy to accept their defaults and a lot of things, you can get moving a lot faster. But if you really start wanting to tweak in the knobs and stuff, then Estio with its 14 million lines of YAML is where you probably want to be. But I always go for Linkerd as well by default. Yeah. So. I do find it's, um, it's easier to, to um, modify as well um, or even update as you go along. So the way we, we've got it running is we, we deploy it from uh, Azure DevOps and then keep sort of on top of it uh, by 
um, almost always checking for for the latest stable, and then we just run that um, the the install command over the top at the end of a deploy, uh, just to keep on top of it. But we're just sort of starting to look at things like the the or bringing in the canary deploys into it and stuff like that as well. I know. Are you using the Linkerd straight up traffic shaping, or are you going through something like Flagger? Um having a look at both options at the minute um flagger is is my my preferred way of doing things um but uh sort of approaching it with with my overall team is to go like, here are our options how do you want to go about it because flagger seems to be a much um a much nicer way of also managing feature toggling yeah there's some nice stuff there too yeah definitely it's pretty cool um, how how is that for for everybody as well, guys? How are you uh, doing? Yeah, it was a very very enjoyable and informative. Um, I think, um, like I say, it's it's difficult when you're sucked into the ecosystem of one of the major cloud vendors um, to see what's what's happening, which is almost transcends or is cloud agnostic, um, which this sounds like. It's aiming to be in a, of a fashion. Yeah, that's an interesting point, James, because I was, you know, sometimes I've heard the term cloud native to be more about software as a service in cloud vendors rather than necessarily generically open source products. Or not just open source, but cloud agnostic, as you say. Exactly. Although not necessarily, I mean, I think sometimes it's about. In an ideal world, you've got a set of workloads that you could shift from one platform to another. You know, you could run it on EKS or AKS with, with only minor tweaks. That would be an ideal world. And that's, that's but other times it's almost that you know, in with these kind of products, you know that you could run them in these different places and that there'd be an underlying layer of, of reconfiguration. But you've got a lot of, you've got a lot of certainty. You know, there's a measure of uncertainty, but it's a, it's a finite measure. Yeah, it's interesting. We've been having a bit of a chat with Richard on YouTube comments about um, the databases and containers and, and, and the like. And it, and it kind of made me start to talk about the fact that, you know, there's an awful lot of things that you would probably reach for cloud native or at least vendors to, to manage services for you these days rather than reinventing the wheel. So uh, interesting to hear Richard's on YouTube about that. It's, it's, it's obviously when you're stitching a solution together and whether that cloud agnostic aspect is a prerequisite or a requirement, or that you're um, you are looking for your your cloud vendors PaaS services where you can get that that value for money or that that velocity to say okay you know be it a part of be it a function as a service or be it a database managed database service, and the um, for some of these things yeah, the interoperability is quite straightforward, but other places you want that kind of almost like a, sometimes a layer of abstraction to say okay. I can then shift out one solution and put in another um, as a strategic choice. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the argument about stateful workloads on and containers and, and Kubernetes has been going on for years now. And people always say you sh shouldn't do it. But I mean, you can run stateful, you can run databases on Kubernetes in the same fashion you would on bare metal. You know, you pan it to a node, you mount in a host directory and just say run. And I'd still rather that over provisioning my own VMs and running it that way because there's still a lot... You don't, we can't take advantage of the state reconciliation loop. We can't take advantage of you know, health checks and restarts and all that other stuff. Like, obviously, there's pain points from an ephemeral point of view in databases, but I'd still rather take my chances there. <laughs> I think the, you know, the, it, yeah. it varies, doesn't it, as well? Because it's, um, if, you, if you, I guess from, from the point of view, if you're, if you're looking to stay, like, like James was saying, cloud agnostic or portable, which for me is something I would look to avoid, generally because there's there's added cost implication there and trying to stay agnostic all the time uh, and so on um but if you're say if you're hosting in, in azure there's nothing to say you can't just host all of your app containers in, within kubernetes and orchestrate them like that and then call out to azure sql or cosmos db or the service bus and go through that through that route instead and have the the headache of managing that service separately or let's say um Redis is a good example. Like if you want to go for high availability and clustering and you, you really need to look down, or at least last time I checked, you really need to look down the, the Redis enterprise route. Otherwise it's kind of a bit hacky and a bit fiddly. Um, 
you've got the 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 added headache of maintaining all of that uh almost total cost of ownership of um of having to to maintain the databases maintain um the the service level and stuff like that that you could hand off elsewhere yeah it kind of feels to me like that we're at a point where the container revolution is the last stand for modeling your own virtual machines and we are moving more towards software as a service and and the function sort of abstraction because why bother running your own tin if you don't need to be bothered with it so again this idea of being cloud agnostic i remember doing a talk at um, elastic user group in london and asos the clothing retailer were there and they were talking about how they were still running their elastic stack completely on the first iteration of as your vms because they'd never had the time to go back and recode and, and take advantage of newer abstractions and it's it's all very well people talking that they want to be vendor agnostic but actually you'd probably be quicker to market if you actually just accepted the uh, opinionated versions that you just plump for and just get it done rather than trying to come up with a generic solution you've got one end of the spectrum you've got oh let's go complete cloud agnostic and then and then practice that by deploying that solution and reconfiguring it for various different environments, even like that to on-prem. The other end is the pure cloud native. Somewhere in the middle is that compromise where you understand, you, A, you've de-risked it to a certain degree, or you've at least put in those components, those really embedded components that will enable that, like layer, abstraction layers, for example, things like storage. And then you know that there's a there's a lot of uncertainty, but less you know you, you know you know there's a bit of work to do but there's not that much work to do to move from one cloud platform is there's that much or like a a, a certain um uh window of, of work to do um and that I mean, obviously that's then then it's up to your to your product people or whatever management is to 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 gauge what you what they want what how much work they want to do or when, when there's just enough has been done Yeah, I think David's point about microservices being a, a journey towards at least being able to hang a label off each part of your system to say what does it do is is the right journey for anybody dealing with a massive system. I've got a, a, another thread. I've only got a couple of minutes. Um, um, David, in your experience so far, the, the division of labour and skills and aptitude and things like that between a lot of what you talked about has been in, in, in the DevOps side of things, although a lot of this is about developers as well. And obviously you do get your all-round polyglots or people who can do it, turn their hand to everything. What are you finding with that division of labor in your, your particular area? I mean, I see developers taking a lot more ownership of the operational aspects of these systems than I have in, yeah. in the past. Okay. Um, which is great to see, you know, developers do want to understand, you know, the networking and Kubernetes, the service discovery. Just, there's a lot more collaboration, I find, from the old over the wall mentality that, you know, that was just what happened in the 90s and early 2000s. So um, I think it's a lot more accessible because there's a, a, a standard API to target. Like Kubernetes is at the end of the day, an API we can target to deploy applications. While the developers might not take ownership of that cluster being healthy, they are happy to take ownership of their application on that target, which I really appreciate and like to see. But is that through volunteering or through compulsion? <laughs> uh, pass. I don't know. A little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think because, you know, they can use the YAML manifest format to describe the behaviors they want. You know, if we use traffic shaping as an example, being able to do Canadian deployments by leveraging, you know, things within the cluster, like Linkerd or Istio or Flagger, like they can start to dip their toe in and play with some of these options that just weren't available to them in the past. It's, it's no longer massively uncharted territory. It's, it's more accessible because you can do a lot more things, especially with the cloud, yeah. Yeah, like, you know, deploying a horizontally scalable application, you know, even as little as 10 years ago would involve knowledge of HA proxy or Nginx to sit in front of it and then doing the health checks and doing all of this stuff. And, you know, then you had to do your TLS provisioning. You had, it was complicated stuff. And usually developers didn't want to get their hands dirty with Puppet or Chef or Bash Script if it was the Wild West. But now that it's, oh, I just write a manifest and apply it to this cluster thingy, like it's a, a lot more approachable. 
and even the, I don't know if anyone's familiar with the service catalog, but you can provision cloud vendor resources through Kubernetes Manifest now. Now I'm not suggesting this is a good approach, but I definitely see a lot of people going, "Oh, I can have an RDS. I'll just apply this manifest." And definitely interesting times. Yeah, I had um, play around with a lot of um, cloud native uh, applications like Prometheus, Grafana, and uh, InfluxDB and those tools are so lightweight and so effective to use. And so, I mean, even for legacy applications, the value which it can create, like um, the JMX uh, thing for Java applications and the um, and to analyze the performance of those, just by using those tools is, is, is really um, amazing. Um, but it, as as it said, I mean, it, the code base becomes so much for every company. It becomes very difficult to forget about change it. it even for building itself, it takes so much time. So yeah, there's a lot of work which is there to uh, put into Kubernetes or change into microservices, which a lot of companies struggle with, I think. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy road to travel. As much as all these tools that I'm talking about are, are going to make it a bit more bearable and, and handle a lot of some of the common problems, like you know, deploying and operating a microservice system is, is still difficult. There's still a lot to understand, especially from the monitoring point of view. Um, it's just so much to understand when you're looking at HTTP logs from 40 or 50 different services and trying to work out which one is actually causing the failure, even though 12 of those calls are all over a second. Like, yeah, it's painful. It's, it's like the monolith, but just a different set of dimensions. Okay, guys. Um, so just, uh, before we get back into uh, and resume with uh, Stuart. Um, first, uh, I'd like to thank David again for uh, his talk earlier this evening. Uh, uh, I think that was, that was pretty well received and uh, uh, very informative. Uh, and I like the, the conversation that has been, it spawned afterwards. It's been quite, uh, quite enjoyable. Uh, just a quick reminder for everybody, uh, if you are interested in winning a JetBrain, uh, JetBrain's product license for a year um just send a tweet with the hashtag hashtag uh, devops nuts um and without further ado i'd like to uh, welcome stuart pocklington uh with his talk on why using the term developer makes me feel like an uh, an imposter uh so i'll hand over to you stuart thank you and uh i'd just like to start off by saying uh, liam thanks for having me uh, appreciate it. And David, great talk. I wish I'd have gone first uh, because this is going to be nowhere near as good as that. <laughs> but uh, uh, I'll just share my screen one second. Um, can someone just let me know when you can see my screen? Just give me a thumbs up or something. Yeah, cool. Okay, so why using the term developer makes me feel like a, an imposter? And I think when you kind of uh, listen to me talk through this, you'll realize that I, I very loosely use the term developer to describe myself. Uh, and as I do so, you'll probably realize that I'm a complete fraud when I do it, because uh, especially, you know, hearing uh, some of the things you guys are talking about, um, you guys are way ahead of me in terms of what a developer actually means you know in terms of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, but I just want to talk you through my journey of uh, why I even use the, the term developer to describe myself um, and take you on the the bit of a you know the journey um, that got me to where I am um, with it so I'm uh, a co-founder of Soapbox um, um, our partner in that is called Dan Maloney. I think he's on this call. Hi, Dan, if you're listening. Uh, and we develop skills, actions, and capsules for voice platforms. Uh, so that's Amazon Alexa, uh, Bixby for Samsung devices, and Google Assistant. And I also currently work part-time for Eon 
as a solutions team manager. Um, give you a bit of background on my work history. So um, I left school back in 1996, uh, back in good old days. Um, and my first job uh, was, uh, it was an apprentice sheet metal worker uh, slash uh, welder uh, at Canal Sheet Metal, um, just opposite the Showcase Cinema uh, in Nottingham. Uh, I did that for a little bit and then decided I didn't like it. And then I've done a host of different um, jobs. So I never really knew what I wanted to do. It took me a long time to work it out. Um, so I've stacked shelves in supermarkets. Uh, I've been a taxi driver. I've been a courier. I've been a driving instructor. Um, I, work, I say I work for NTL. It's for another company called Q-Link. Um, and my job uh, was to go out and collect NTL boxes when um, customers had ended the contracts. Um, I worked at PC, PC Service Call in Lenton um, once upon a time. Didn't last there very long because I kept telling customers about the consumer rights. Um, so it wasn't getting ripped off, um, which didn't go down very well. Um, so I didn't last there very long. Um, <clears throat> And then about 12 years ago, I joined Eon, uh, started off in the call center. Um, and in, in for speaking to SME customers, uh, and then I slowly just progressed through Eon uh, to the role I'm in uh, currently today. But yeah, I've done a, a big, you know, wide variety of different jobs. Um, and it took me a long time before I kind of uh, found something that I was passionate um, to do. Um, and that kind of passion was around developing things. <clears throat> and how did I get into it? And um, some of you will look at this and, and just scoff because this is like um, probably stuff you did in school. Um, but for me, it, like I say, I was late to the game. I started off... Um, with InfoPath, um, I opened it um, once by mistake, and I was curious about um, what it is and what it does. Uh, I started um, building out user forms in InfoPath. Um, so it's uh, what you see is what you get um, kind of um, <clears throat> development form building tool. Um, but there's actually, you can go um, quite deep in the, the kind of logic of, of what it does in there. Um, and I found um, opportunities to improve uh, some workflows uh, when I was working in the call center. Um, and we managed to save uh, quite a lot of uh, time on various processes. And we even managed to uh, remove the need, uh, the need for an entire team uh, that was based in that call center just because we uh, reduced the workflow so much just by using user forms in there. Um, and <clears throat> from that, I've got an interest in SharePoint. I've done a lot of SharePoint development. Um, uh, but originally, I think when I first started using it, it was using SharePoint 2003. Uh, really old, um, not, not brilliant. Um, I managed to do some good stuff in there. But what I started doing is building my kind of own custom HTML uh, web applications kind of hosted on top of uh, SharePoint so I could add a bit more functionality um, and obviously the CSS and, and the JavaScript there uh, as well that's kind of um, where I started out um, with that and then I got into voice uh, probably about three or four years ago now and it started off uh, when I uh, I think it was Christmas or for a birthday present I got a Amazon Alexa and Echo Dot. Um, and I just got obsessed with smart home devices. So um, I think every bulb in my house is uh, smart. It's either a, a LifeX bulb or it's a, an Ikea uh, Treadfree. Uh, tread I don't know how you pronounce that bulb. Um, smart plugs everywhere. I've got some, some smart things. Um, I've, I've got myself a, a Google Home assistant and I was just really really curious about how it all worked uh, and I wanted to know because it, it was bugging me so I started to delve into it a little bit to try and understand um, what it what it is that you need to do uh, to be able to develop uh, for initially smart um, devices uh, on voice assistants 
Uh, but then also that quickly led to like custom skills um, that you can get uh, or custom actions or, or capsules, depending on what device you're on. Um, and then I discovered something called Storyline. So this is a, or, or it was, should I say, this is a, a kind of no code uh, editor for developing voice applications. Um, and I use this as a, a kind of a jumping off point just to kind of understand what the different components are for uh, developing in voice. Um, and from there, I kind of um, ju jumped off there again to go into the coding side of it to get more control uh, and to be able to do uh, more things without the constraints of um, a third party uh, provider there. Um, and if anyone is interested in something like this, so Storyline doesn't exist anymore, um, there is a service called VoiceFlow, which is out there, which is very similar. Uh, and if you're interested in dipping your toes into the world of voice, um, I'd recommend that as a, a starting point for you to um, take a look at and, and have a play at creating a custom skill uh, on Alexa. Uh, and I entered a few competitions. So um, after I've done a few uh, basic skills, I think the first skill was uh, one called Nottingham Sayings, where uh, you could ask Alexa for a random Nottingham saying, and then it would come back with one, which would be like, hey, up me duck, and then it translate that into English uh, for people to understand what, what's actually being said. <clears throat> um, I, and I did a few other skills, um, and I decided to enter into uh, a few competitions uh, on Dev Post. I think I've entered three, um, and I've, uh, I've won outright the Alexa... Um, APL, which is Alexa Presentation Language um, Competition, uh, probably around this time last year. Uh, and a few months before that, I won the Alexa Tech for Good competition with EV Assistant, uh, which was a skill uh, which would just leverage some uh, public APIs to locate um, EV charging stations um, just through uh, a simple voice conversation. Uh, and the, the one I won outright uh, is called Loop It, which is a skill um, which uh, allows you basically to create your own music loops uh, just again through uh, a voice conversation, choosing a few different combination of loops and then combining them to uh, to get a loop out the, the end of it. Um, and from there, I've, I've, that kind of gave me the confidence uh, to uh, form Soapbox. Um, and currently, um, I've got um, a few uh, client skills on the go from it. Um, so I'm, good, I'm starting to uh, make a bit of money from it. Not a lot, but it's, um, it's a start. So I've, I'm developing a skill um, for the Big Brother IP, uh, Top Trumps. Uh, we're working with Flying High um, Academy, um, which has got um, quite a few schools uh, under its umbrella in, in knots. Uh, I did a skill for Chuffle Chuck, which is a, a tiger nut milk drink. Um, that's out there. And I've also done uh, quite a few um, skills for radio stations as well. Um, did one for Alabama Radio. And I did one for, uh, it was a German radio station and it plays the craziest music you've um, ever heard. Um, but yeah, so I've kind of gone from just having a, a curiosity uh, in the world of voice to turning it into uh, something where I'm, I'm working um, when I'm not working at Eon I'm um, developing um, skills for for clients so um, which is something I'm, I'm quite proud about um, and um, you know I, I, I pretty much I design skills I develop skills um, and maintain those those skills roll them out <clears throat> Um, and by the way, I'm flying through this talk. Um, it's not going to last an hour, so apologies for that. But um, just to get back to the point of why do I feel like an imposter um, for using the word developer, um, I think there's, there's a few reasons. So um, one is um, no matter how good you get at something, there's 
always people that are a million times better than you. And it's like these things that have been discussed on this call, uh, on this meeting, which I don't even understand. Um, and it will take me, uh, it'll probably take me uh, a year or more of just constantly trying new things just to get in that, that space where you guys are. Um, and by the time I do, you would have moved on uh, and you're off doing something else, which I don't understand. So I feel like I've, I'm always playing catch up um, and I've never kind of worked in um, a kind of uh, an environment where I'm surrounded by other developers um, and we're rolling out something uh, as big as some of the things that you, you guys have, have talked about. Um, and I also feel like because I've started quite late as well, um, I'm, I'm self-taught on everything I do. Um, I feel like, um, yeah, the, the word developer um, is something that at best I can only use very loosely. Um, however, having said that, it is something I really enjoy. Um, and I and enjoy coming on to meetings like this um, just to kind of understand what other people are doing um, because I do uh, learn from that and I can take things away uh, and try and implement best practice uh, on the things I do uh, myself. Um, and my takeaway from it is the term developer is a broad church, a bit like analyst. Um, pretty much everyone is an analyst at something uh, these days. And I think the, the term developer uh, is very similar in a lot of ways. Um, so uh, when I was developing um, Alexa skills on a, a no code platform, uh, I wouldn't have described myself as a developer. Um, however, many other people would. Um, and the same when I look back and when I uh, first opened up InfoPath uh, many, many years ago and started dabbling with that, um, I wouldn't have described myself as doing anything uh, close to developing in there. However, um, I was developing applications with it, which is, um, it feels like a bit of a fraudulent um, way of using that term developer for that. However, it's, it's still something that added value to that business. Um, <clears throat> Like I said, there's always going to be someone better than you at something. Um, and some people will enjoy letting you know that they're better than you at certain things, which is fine. So um, everyone will know um, what at least one person, and I would have thought, who yeah, enjoys telling them how good they are. Um, but it doesn't matter. So I find if I just keep doing what I'm doing and I'm enjoying what I'm doing, um, then I can... You know, I can live with that and I can live with uh, uh, describing myself loosely as a developer as long as I'm happy doing what I'm doing and I, I feel okay with that. Uh, and you might feel like an imposter like me, uh, but it's probably only you or me in my case that gives a flying hoot about it. Um, and my, my timings are way too fast on these slides. So Liam, I apologize because this isn't going to last as a as long as maybe you would have hoped. Um, but That's I, definitely fine, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> but if anyone's got any questions that they'd like to fire at me, uh, feel free. Uh, anything related to some of the, the things I've talked about in my slides or anything voice related, I'm more than happy uh, to take any questions on that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I guess from, from minor things, I mean, I'm someone who struggles quite a bit with imposter syndrome myself. Um, I left school early and I'm basically everything I know is completely self-taught as well. Um, how do you, how do you cope in going into those client meetings or, or speaking uh, to them feeling like everyone else in the room is better than you or, or, or smarter than you or like what, what do you sort of, do with yourself to be able to to make yourself uh, sort of get through that yeah that's that's a really good question so uh and i suppose it depends on on who the client is uh, and who i'm talking to um so there's a bit of preparation there around getting to know the client um beforehand so um 
uh, that really helps when it comes to knowing what kind of level you want to pitch at. Um, but then also, I think you've you've got to um, when you're putting yourself in in that position, you've got to have a little bit of self belief. Um, if you're confident in your own abilities. Um, and you know you can you can deliver the goods. Um, then sometimes you, um, you have to blow your own trumpet a little bit, um, um, which is, doesn't come easy sometimes. Um, but I, I find that you know I've I've, I've done enough uh, things now, which I'm I'm you know I'm proud that I've done. Uh, I've I've seen some relatively um, minor success on things. Um, and you know, don't be frightened to call it out and, and sell your benefits, and also um, be comfortable with who you are as well. So, um, like me, I I know um, there's some of there's some development roles I just would never be able to get anywhere close to. Um, there's there's some uh, businesses that um, they advertise developer roles, and I look at it and say, yeah. Although it sounds absolutely amazing, I just couldn't do that. Um, I just wouldn't be good enough. Wouldn't be up to it. However, there is other things that I am good at. Um, so, um, a great example um, in in uh, Eon, where I work at the moment, there's a, a developer, absolutely amazing at his job, um, but he struggles to talk to people. Um, whereas, uh, so so I'm not as good as a developer but I'm more comfortable with sitting in a room full of strangers and talking. So that's a, a strength of mine. Um, and sometimes having, a, you know, some blended skills, um, you might be a jack of all trades, but it's not always a bad thing. Perfect. Thank you very much. Um, uh, does anybody else have uh, any other questions? Now we've remembered to allow people to unmute themselves. <laughs> It's a little bit of a, probably why there's a bit of a silence before. Yeah, Stuart. Um, hi. Wanted to say big fan of Loop It, by the way. You did a really good job with that. Um, big fan. Um, when you started looking at moving away from Codeless and actually writing it yourself, uh, obviously that's quite a big step. Can I ask what uh, kind of tech stack you went into to start with? Because that, that's often quite a difficult thing for people to move into. Yeah, yeah. Good question. So I moved into... Um, the ask SDK using Node.js, um, just mainly because there was um, lots and lots of documentation and uh, templates out there, uh, which I could use, which I could look at and, and start to understand. I, I considered using Python for it, um, but the, there was, although there is some um, good examples of um, skills coded in, in Python out there, there's a lot fewer. Uh, and I found out the community, um, um, and the, you know the kind of network I'd built up um, was also using that kind of um, stack, so it was easy for me to move in and, and uh, reach out to people for help with that. Well, as a as a quick follow up with that foundation, how easy did you find it to move into kind of doing Google and Samsung and kind of really embracing more of the ecosystem? Was that did that take you a long time, or is that was that relatively straightforward once you got those basics? In? Yeah, so with Google, I found it very easy. Um, uh, and I've, I've just joined a beta program for them. Um, they've got a new, um, they've got a kind of new um, set up for developing actions on Google, um, which makes the whole process uh, really, really simple. And you can use a combination of uh, Node.js uh, and, or, and or YAML uh, on that as well, which is really cool. Um, Bixby, I struggled with initially. Um, it was um, a lot different to uh, creating a, a skill on Alexa or an action on Google. Um, but it, it took me a little while to uh, get my head around it, but once I did, um, I actually really enjoyed uh, building out uh, my first capsule with that. That's great, thank you. Yes, you. Um... Just before I ask my question, I, I utterly recognise uh, what you're saying there um, and came in from a non-computing background many, many years ago and felt that. And then as you know, as one's confidence grew and uh, one's, one started to appreciate exactly what you said about 
the we all bring different traits, different strengths to the team, um, and that they should complement each other. Um, and then you you start to realise that um, one's not an imposter um, and never was possibly. Um, but, but the question would be. Um, it, if you were if you were to advise a team leader or a manager on how to how to deal well kind of avoid or to deal with this this scenario what would be your advice um what around the person uh, feeling like they're they're an imposter yeah or just about the, the, across your a team be it a small or a big one you mm. may you, there's a high probability you will have that that kind of variability and then people who may feel imposters yeah no that's really good so um, I've, I manage a, a team of um, four, four or five people um, at work and they've all got um, different strengths and weaknesses um, and they've, they've all kind of in, in different points in their, their kind of um, development within the role. Um, but what I do with, with my guys is, is try to get them to kind of uh, play on the strengths, uh, share their knowledge uh, with others in the team um, but also ask for help and don't be don't worry about asking for help from other people in the team and I find by doing that because because kind of people are they've got an opportunity to shine on the things that they, they're really good at um, but they've also got the opportunity to learn on the things that they're not so good at from other people I find that brings a good balance to the team um, and um, you know people might find that there's, there's something else that they'd quite like to uh, develop in and, and specialise in. Um, they might not, uh, it, well, it might take them a while to get there, um, but I think as long as you support them uh, in role and also uh, give them the opportunity to train if they want to, um, then I think, um, yeah, you can, you can help manage that. Um, and also, uh, just by speaking to people, um, and having an honest conversation with them. So if they are feeling like that, I can share my experience with them as well. Um, yeah, so, um, I, think, I suppose the worst thing, uh, is, is if you do have imposter syndrome, uh, talk about it. Because if, if you don't talk about it, um, you'll probably always feel that way um, and nothing will, will change around that. Great, cheers, nice. Uh, any further questions before we move on to the wrap-up? Cool. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much, um, Stuart, for coming and talking this evening. Um, let me just actually make my screen share as it was bugging out with uh, Zoom. Uh, and a huge thank you for David as well. Uh, he has had to shoot off. Um but uh, I'm sure if you uh, tweet uh, either of the guys um, on Twitter, you'll uh, be able to to continue the conversations there. Uh, as always, you know we also have Slack, um, and uh, we're also on the Technoscom Slack and so on as well. Uh, what we don't currently have is the working winning tweet picker. So what I will do is I will do that outside of um outside of this and uh we'll announce the the winner on twitter and direct them uh, directly message them um but what we will do here is i just want to mention next month's uh devops nuts which is taking place on the 26th of may uh, we've got ross schonfeld from the university of nottingham to talk about uh giving his talk old industries and new ways uh and we also have a uh, special guest uh gene kim who is author of the Phoenix Project, the Unicorn Project, uh, the, uh, the DevOps Handbook, and a plethora of other things uh, to come and give his talk on the Unicorn Project and the five ideals. Um, so hopefully we'll see you next time. Um, we'll be live on YouTube again and uh, through Zoom. Uh, you can find us on meetup.com uh, and just search for DevOps Nuts. Uh, but thank you very much, and we'll see you all on the 26th of May. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Uh, wait, how do I stop the... Thank you.